Our first scripture today is out of the Old Testament. It's from the book of, the Je- of Jeremiah. We're in chapter 23. We're going to read verses 23 through 32. It starts out with the voice of God. You know, am I, am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them? declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of the lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Through the prophet who has a dream, recount the dream. But let the one who has my word speak it faithfully, for what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. And now out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 20, it starts, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And then it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Truly, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And this is the word of God. God. So it's our first Sunday in Lent, you know, a time of preparation. We talk about Advent being a time of preparation and Lent being a time of preparation. So it's a time to try and set things aside to make space for God to do something new in us and to help us grow in our journey. So I shared on Wednesday that, you know, this is why we practice giving things up for Lent um, in order to make space for God to do something new. So if we want to know God better, you know, maybe our desire is to spend more time in God's word so we give up something to make that possible. So maybe we give up an hour of TV in the evening so that that time can be reallocated to reading scripture. You know, as we read scripture, you'll notice each of the gospel tells us and teaches us about Jesus, and there's a lot of material that overlaps, but each also has its own perspective and will emphasize different parts of Jesus's ministry. So this Lent, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew each Sunday and what it teaches us about Jesus. So in the Gospel of Matthew, he will place great importance on Jesus as a teacher. And in the Gospel of Matthew, there are five major teaching sessions. So each week, we're going to look at one of those five sections. And we're going to start with the Sermon on the Mount, probably one of the most well-known And anytime I think of the Sermon on the Mount, I think about an article I read years and years ago at this point between Chris Tomlin, worship artist, singer, um, musician in general, 
and Louis Giglio that he works a lot with, who is an incredible preacher. And in this interview, they said that they had this ongoing discussion about what was more important in worship, the music or the word. And so they would state their arguments, even if they weren't together, they, every once in a while they'd shoot off an email to each other. And uh, Chris Tomlin said, you know, I sent an email to Louis one day and I said, amazing grace, enough said. He said, and Louis answered him right away, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus. You know, that um, really it's a, it's a combination of both and we have powerful moments. And for many, the Sermon on the Mount is uh, a powerful testimony on a lot of things that Jesus shares with us. So in, in that whole sermon, Jesus is going to talk about murder and worry and prayer and divorce and fasting and judging others. And the list goes on. They were there for a while. Today we're going to talk about this section that deals with true and false prophets and the warnings that we find within them. You know, and it's not the only place in the Bible we hear these warnings about false prophets and what it can do with us. So we're going to start the conversation by looking at our scripture from Jeremiah, and it's going to help us frame what we find in Matthew. So Jeremiah is himself a prophet, you know, called to share a message directly from God that is not an easy message. Um, to say it's not an easy message is an understatement. Really, it's a message that the people aren't going to want to hear, and it comes at a particularly difficult time in their history. And you know, at the same time, there's false prophets telling people what they do want to hear. So who do you think they're going to listen to? You know, one message is uncomfortable and difficult and is trying to focus on things that need to be seen, and one message is, is telling people what they want to hear. So in Jeremiah, God reminds us, you know, that there is no place to hide where God cannot see what is going on. And God says in there, you know, I have heard the prophets who are prophesying in my name and who are telling lies. And you know what God's talking about here? He makes it very clear that we're not talking about misunderstanding, a misinterpretation, a way of a different way of interpreting, because we may all interpret things slightly different. You know, he is talking about, you know, God is speaking about intentional deceit in sharing God's word. You know, prophets who their message is the deceit of their own hearts. People who call themselves prophets who are sharing a message that is intentionally designed to mislead people and to send people astray, make people forget God's name, people who have a message that will ultimately not benefit them and take them in the opposite direction that they need to go. And that they're not usually upfront about it, um, but the message sounds good at first. It sounds like we want to hear. So uh, this, this section of Jeremiah was one of my favorites in a class in seminary. I think because it applies to so many areas of our lives. You can take whatever um, field of interest you were involved in, and I think you can find correlations. So you know I was a political science major who did campaigns right after graduation. So on the one hand, exciting and exhilarating work. Um, I did a lot of research ahead of time before I worked for anybody. And, you know, I honestly believed and still believe there are people that get into politics, you know, trying to do good. You know, but you also don't have to look very far to see that there's a lot of misdirection and sometimes there's deceit. You know, there's managing perception. You know, isn't that what advertising is all about sometimes, about managing perception? Um, I think I learned this lesson in two powerful encounters. So one, I was volunteering on a campaign, trying desperately to get a job shortly after college. And I was at a debate, and the two candidates stood up in front, and one said to the other, you know, it was, it was a particularly challenging race. Um, one said to the other, you know, I'll vow right here and now to make this a, not a negative campaign environment, if you will. And the other candidate stood up and they shook hands and they agreed. And the next morning, you know, that second candidate's incredibly negative ads hit every print media around. You know, when I wonder about that moment, you know, where this agreement is made, 
you know, knowing that it's not even going to live 12 hours. Um, and, you know, that was, I don't think I will ever for, forget that moment. The other was a trip to D.C. while I was still in college um, for a, we met with some incredible people that day. One, very powerful, even when he walked in the room, you could, you could sense it, and had been a campaign worker and talked about a pivotal issue that changed the whole tide of a presidential election that was determined just by focus groups of what can we tell you about the opposite candidate that will change your idea about them. It wasn't a presidential issue, but they kept pushing buttons in small groups until they found something that heightened people's emotions. Um, and to me, that was less about saying what needed to be said and more about what will get an a rise out of the people. But you know, like I said, you know, these these are the examples that jumped out at me cuz this was my field of of work, but we don't have to look very far to find people in every walk of life who are going the opposite direction. Um, that reveal truths to us and that give us insights that help shape our convictions, both about the kind of people we want to be and the things that we need to be more careful around. So we take that back to the scripture about false prophets, and God is very clear. God says, I am against them. I did not appoint them. I did not send them. They are not from me. You know, the message they are sharing is not my words. It's from themselves, or they're stealing it from each other. You know, in the Old Testament, we hear this phrase a lot, you know, that the true prophet will say, thus says the Lord. You know, trying to tell people, you know, the words I'm giving you, I received from God. But God is very clear, you know, sometimes people claiming God's word are not sharing God's word. And I think they gain ground, and what the scripture tells us sometimes is that they gain ground when we want to believe something because it's what we want to hear. So in the message paraphrase, it says, do these prophets give two cents about me and spewing out their grandiose delusions? You know, it's very clear that it's their agenda they're putting forward. Um, And we hear a very consistent message in Matthew that teaches us a lot of the same lessons. You know, Jesus is going to spend some time talking about true prophets and about false prophets. And Jesus is going to use words like deceit. And he's going to talk about intentionality and misrepresentation. You know, he starts by saying, false prophets come in sheep's clothing. You know, they'll come looking a certain way that will keep your defenses down and not raise suspicion or not cause scrutiny. But it says, inwardly they are ferocious, ravenous wolves. You know, that they may sound sincere, but they're anything but sincere. So it's similar to the words we hear in Jeremiah about them sharing the deceit of their own heart. You know, it tells us to beware and be careful Um, It takes some effort, you know, that to see what is going on. But the scripture tells us you will know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their actions. You'll know them because the way they live is not consistent with what they're saying. You know, and that's to say, you know, I think sometimes we can hear someone's heart when they're speaking But there are people that try to misrepresent that. And people will show themselves to you by how they live. And of course, we have to be careful, you know, using that, not taking it too far, because none of us is perfect, right? All of us are going to fall short at some point, and we're on a journey. We would, uh, too far down that road, and we cross into the warning on the Sermon of Mount, you know, for us not to judge, or will be judged. Um, about taking, about worrying about the speck in someone else's eye instead of the speck in our eye. But we look, we also look at behavior as part of, um, I guess, gaining authenticity when we are sharing God's word, if that is how we are living. You know, when it's not a mistake, when it's not a shortcoming but when God's word is being intentionally misrepresented. 
Um, one translation says they might smile a lot and they might be dripping with practice sincerity, but were warned not to be impressed with charisma, but to look for character. Um, I think one of the biggest differences is a life and a message that is self-centered versus God-centered. You know, that rings bells for us. It's one of the ways we can easily spot something that we need to be on guard against. You know, we, there are things that we all find important in Scripture. And when we hear a message that directly contradicts about who we have learned God to be, that's our call to pay closer attention, that it's someone else's agenda and not God's agenda. So for me, anytime I would read reports or see stories where it starts with the word God hates and then it's followed by a group of people, to me that's a huge red flag that calls us to closer inspection because that's not what we read in scripture. So part of what I think the work for us today is you know, for all of us to think about what are warning signs for us. What are the things that you have found to be true about God and about Christ and about the kind of love, lives that we're called to lead? And, you know, then what has helped you form those beliefs? What scriptures are they based upon? You know, what does it look like when somebody honestly lives this message out? And what does it not look like? that knowing these things helps us go in a different way, even if we're trying to be led in the exact opposite direction. So today, in these few verses on the Sermon on the Mount and throughout the Bible, we know that there are times where there are true prophets and false prophets, that false prophets are not of God, trying to lead the people astray and speaking from their own heart instead of being centered in God's word. So may we see the signs that help us pay attention. May we know who we are and whose we are, that we can see the differences in the lives being lived out around us. May it be so. Amen.